G'day everybody, Patrick here. Today I'm going to be talking about the AWS Solutions Architect Professional Exam and how you can get a 900 plus on the first try. That's out of a thousand, so basically 90%. So this video is going to be split into four parts. Number one, direct preparation. Number two, indirect preparation. Number three, mindset. Number four, exam strategy. So for the first part, in, uh, direct preparation, I'm going to talk about the different resources I use to prepare which ones I'd recommend, and how you can prepare for the exam effectively. So, first one, number one, I would thoroughly recommend this to everyone. You may even just be able to pass this with pretty much this alone. Adrian Cantrell's Solutions Architect Professional course on cantrell.io. I cannot recommend this more. It is seriously an amazing course. Uh, it goes so much beyond the actual requirements for the exam and goes into other topics that are useful as a solutions architect. And I felt very prepared coming out of this course um, to tackle the exam and to also tackle real life projects in AWS. So it has been a very, very high quality course. If you're also at the associate level, or if you just want to refresh your knowledge a bit for if you've recently done the associate exam, but you feel like you only just passed or you want to practice it more, um, he's also got an associate course and it is excellent. The only thing with these two courses is they are a little bit on the pricey side. Um, so I'm in Australia, if you can't tell from my accent, and the Solutions Architect Professional course set me back a bit under 120 Australian dollars, I think. If you compare this to the price of the exams themselves though, which was uh, 440 Australian dollars, I think it really basically doesn't compare. And the quality of, of material you get from this is amazing. I don't know how many hours the course is, but it's easily over 40 hours. And seriously, you <laughs> I cannot recommend it more. The second course that I also really liked, if you're uh, on a bit of a budget or if you just want a shorter course, I wouldn't recommend tackling this exam if you are trying to do it as quickly as possible. It is not that kind of exam. You really do need to have a really good understanding to, to get anywhere with it. Uh, anyway, Stefan Marek on Udemy, he's an amazing instructor and he gives a very good sort of theory heavy course on solutions architect concepts, not as many labs, but the theory is top notch. Other ones, just always the usual culprits, A Cloud Guru and Linux Academy are good for starting points. A lot, often their courses will give you enough to pass the exam. I'd say for their associate level, um, when I did the Associate Solutions Architect, I didn't know about Stefan and Adrian Cantrell hadn't created his course yet. And I passed just fine with 910 out of 1000 on the Solutions Architect Associate last year. The Linux Academy and A Cloud Guru courses are, are great for the associate level courses. I'd say once you get to the specialty and professional level, you either need to do those courses plus a lot of extra study, or you can uh, follow one of the more in-depth courses that's outside of those platforms. The other thing to note with Linux Academy and A Cloud Guru is that recently they've had a, a merger. So A Cloud Guru has acquired Linux Academy. And what that means is that a lot of their courses are now being combined into one. So I believe there is, I may be wrong about this. So if there's someone from A Cloud Guru or Linux Academy, please let me know in the comments. But as far as I'm aware, the Solutions Architect Professional course is now the same between those two platforms. So in terms of courses that I actually followed, and this video is not gonna all be about courses, but it's, it's good to start off with that. I followed the A Cloud Guru course first. I actually did this quite a while ago, far before I was planning to actually do the exam, just mostly out of interest when I was studying for the associate exam. Um, and I, I achieved the associate certification in April last year, so 2019, and then I achieved the professional certification uh, basically this week. So I went through the A Card Guru course a while ago, and then I went through Stefan Marek's course about a month ago, and then recently I just finished up the Adrian Cantrell course, which is a very long course. It took it took almost a month. There is a bit of overlap between these courses, obviously, because they're training towards the same exam. Um, but I liked having a sort of a, a broad introduction with A Cloud Guru and then a more in-depth introduction with um, Stefan Marek and then a really, really thorough overview of the content plus all of the labs with, um, with Adrian Cantrell. Okay, so that's it for direct preparation. I'd say if you can do all those resources, understand everything that's going on, follow along with the labs, you probably would pass. However, this video is for people who are trying to do a really, really, really good exam score. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, now, I have seen people on LinkedIn posting about you know, getting 96, 97, and that is amazing. I really, really um, look up to people who, who can achieve those kinds of scores. Um, personally, I got uh, 915 out of 1,000 on this, um, which I'm very happy with. But yes, obviously there's room for improvement. So, so don't listen to me as your only source. Listen to, to everybody and their, own, and their own opinions and their own advice. That being said, I think I have a bit to say here because I did a lot of extra preparation outside of these courses. 
Uh, in terms of indirect preparation, the absolute best thing you can do if you can manage it is to get some kind of work that involves AWS in some capacity, whether that's a uh, junior operations job or something related to DevOps, or um, if you're just at a company and you're a developer. This is how it started for me. I was a developer at a company and then I started getting a, a bit involved with the cloud side. Between uh, the first company and the second company, I um, was involved with some startups, um, sort of consulting for those uh, and, and helping them set up their own platform. So that was a really great cat crash course in setting up databases, servers, etc., cetera, um, on AWS. And then finally, uh, recently I've been interning with one of the banks in Australia, and we're working on a really interesting set of technology that is all based around uh, deployments on AWS. And there's been data pipelines and lots of machine learning. So I'll talk about machine learning in another video. That has been really helpful. So if that's at all something that's possible for you, I mean, it almost sounds like an, a, a truism that's not even helpful to say because it's so obvious, but but um, maybe some people weren't uh, so aware that having that on-job experience is incredibly valuable and I would recommend it. it. I think I would have not have done anywhere near as well um, had I not had that experience. The other thing is just play around in your own time, open up AWS, get your own account. Don't be afraid to spend a bit of money on it. I know that can sound uh, a bit crude to say that sometimes if, if people are uh, on, a, on a tight budget, but I think the people who are going for these types of exams, especially at the pre professional level, generally will have a bit of um, money that they're willing to spend on this. And if you don't, you should be prioritizing this if this is the uh, the, the sort of work you want to go into. Um, so I sort of set aside, okay, I'm spending 400 on the exam, realistically 200 because you do get a 50% um, off discount when you complete a previous exam. And I've just been carrying those discounts along the whole way. So I've had pretty much all my exams half price. Um, and then on top of that, I'm full spend whatever I need to on the courses to make sure I'm getting the best uh, coverage and then I probably spent another maybe $50 or maybe $100 of AWS just you know setting up different uh, services and playing around with different networking capabilities and all of the very broad things that come into the um, solutions architect professional exam. So in terms of the exam itself, um, you have a very broad range of things that are assessed. You should definitely look at the exam guide um, on amazon.com. Uh, I would highly recommend you do that because it tells you exactly what you need to cover. There's also exam readiness and preparation from Amazon, not exam readiness for the solutions architect professional. Unfortunately, I was looking for that and they didn't seem to have it. They do have for the associate level, but you do have sort of some, some courses you can go through. However, in my experience, I haven't really looked into these too much because the reports I've heard from other people is that the, um, the third party courses, like the ones I was mentioning previously, are of a much higher quality and uh, much easier to just kind of follow. Anyway, so that's indirect preparation. Uh, it sounds obvious, but you need to uh, get some hands-on experience with this. There's no way around it. This is not really an exam that can be crammed for easily. It is a difficult exam for sure. The questions are phrased in a way that often you have multiple paragraphs per question. It's not always the case, but often you will. And for the answers, you have there's a couple of options, but the most common type of answers is you have four options. You have to pick one, the one that is correct, and they're often really, really similar, and none of them are perfect. This is the thing, right? These courses will tell you about, um, let's, let's think of an example. I'll try to think of an example that didn't actually come up in the exam because I don't want to you know, give away the exam questions. Um, let's say something with a VPC, for example. Uh, by the way, if this makes no sense to you, that, that, that's fine. Um, you probably just need to go uh, serve the content. Um, let's say we have an example with a VPC and then we have a network access control list, so NAPL, and then we have security groups on the instances. And then the question might be like, how can we block an IP? So there'd be a couple answers that are obviously wrong. For example, it might say block the IP from the security group. And it's like, well, okay, we can't do that. So then you can rule that one out, but then you might get another answer where it's like the exact thing that you wanted to do. There's like a service that is built exactly for that and it's not an option. So you have to choose between other options that will accomplish this goal, but but maybe they cost more or maybe they just require more maintenance. A really common thing that happens is quite often you'll have a question where it's asking you to do like setting up an alarm or something like this and then having it notify people. And there's a bunch of services that will allow you to do this really idiomatically without uh, too much hassle, but often they won't include that as an answer. And then you have to choose the answer that fits around, you know, setting up a custom Lambda function to handle this for you. So. Um, essentially, the point I'm trying to get across here, I'm not trying to educate you on the exact content of the exam. It's it's more around the, the, the mindset, I suppose, which is sort of the next topic I want to talk about, about how does this exam work and, and what might you find frustrating about it? So 
that is what makes this exam so difficult. You're not going to get uh, three answers that are clearly wrong and one answer that's clearly correct. That usually is what happens with the, the solutions architect associate will be like probably two answers are clearly incorrect and then one answer is like slightly incorrect and one answer is correct. With professional, it's more along the lines of maybe one answer is pretty obviously incorrect but maybe could be correct in a stretch and then there'll be the couple other answers that are almost right but are missing one tiny piece of information and then there'll be the answer that's actually correct is like correct but also not how you would maybe do it because, because it's um it's really testing your ability to not just not just memorize the information not just memorize okay here's how we do this fan out architecture for example it's actually testing your ability to reason about these concepts and to sort of think creatively about it. Yeah, that's a, it's a hard exam. I'm still kind of <laughs> from when I did the other day. Even the specialty exams, I haven't done networking specialty, which is apparently the hardest, but I've done security and machine learning, which are by no means easy. And they were quite a bit easier than this solutions architect professional exam. I think the thing that makes it hard is it's a three hour exam. You have to just keep going the whole time. My brain felt like it was fried probably two hours in. I could barely process some of the questions. I need to just take a breath, take a break and uh, come back to it. But you're also under time pressure and you're not allowed to have a water bottle or anything. So I felt like that would have helped. It was a bit of a hot day. Talking now about exam mindset, there's something else I wanted to bring up. This is kind of a small point. This has happened for me with all of the specialty exams and the Solutions Architect professional exam. I haven't done the DevOps professional yet, but that's my the next one on my list. I don't know if they do this on purpose, but something I have noticed is the first maybe five, maybe 10 questions are all really hard. This has tripped me up every time because I, I try and go through the exam in order unless there's a reason to, to sort of shuffle it up a bit, which I'll talk about in the exam strategy. And so I start off at the start and I was freaking out a little bit when I, when I did this exam because I felt like I was flagging. I think the first seven questions I all flagged and I, and I thought this is going to be a long ride. It turned out a bit better. I think from questions maybe 20 to 50 onwards, I was pretty confident in most of those. I probably flagged five of them out of those 30 questions. So I felt a lot better about that. But the first few questions are really hard. And I noticed the same thing with machine learning and the same thing with security. So I think it may be something they do on purpose. There's a couple of reasons they might do it. Number one is it could just be like a psychological manipulation thing. I feel like maybe I'm being a bit of a conspiracy theorist about that. I, I can't see why they would want to do that. What I do think is possible though, is they do have a thing where they will test out new exam questions and they don't contribute to your score. And I would have assumed these would have been spread out randomly throughout the exam. However, it's possible they could just put them at the start. And that's why they might be harder because they might be around you know, newer concepts that, that people are less familiar with or things that aren't explicitly taught in these courses, etc. And that's why I felt like they were really tricky. So if anyone's from AWS and knows about this or anyone who's contributed to the exams knows sort of how that structure works, I'd be really keen to know. Potentially it's confidential information that we can't know about, but that is a comment I'd like to make. If you're feeling like you're freaking out in the first 10 questions, don't worry so much. It probably will get a bit easier. This is not going to get easy. This is not an easy exam, but it will probably get easier. That was the main thing I want to say with the mindset. The other thing is you've got to go into the exam. You've got to feel well prepared. I'd always suggest you definitely have to do the AWS practice exam that they provide. You'll get a free voucher to do this if you do any of the other exams. So you get basically they like to, to keep people sort of in the exam train um, where you, you do one exam, they give you all these benefits to do the next ones. So you get a free practice exam voucher, which is quite nice because these otherwise cost like $50. And you'll also get a half price off the next exam, plus a bunch of other benefits like you get access to this store where you can buy like shirts and water bottles and stuff. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is the uh, the practice exam vouchers So and, and, the, and the half price exams. So do this practice exam. It's usually 20 questions. Uh, they give you 60 minutes to do it, but you can normally smash it out in half an hour to 40 minutes. And for some reason, I always seem to do worse on the practice exam than the actual exams. I think I got 80% on the Solutions Architect Professional Practice Exam, and then I got 91, uh, 915 out of 1,000 on the actual exam. So it may or may not be an accurate indicator. I'd say if you fail the practice exam, though, it may make you want to uh, question whether you, should, whether you should do a bit more study before you book the actual exam. I've had a bit of a bad habit of doing the practice exams like on the day of the professional, of, of the actual exam. And... This is a bad habit because you can, uh, you can only cancel um, before 24 hours before your actual exam. So if I had found out from this practice exam I was going to do really badly, then I would have done really badly. <laughs> oh, a bit more information actually. Something for a direct preparation resource. Uh, Tutorials Dojo has excellent practice exams. I would recommend them to anyone. 
I think combination of the Adrian Cantor course plus Tutorials Dojo, maybe Stefan Marek, if you want a bit of extra theory stuff, you probably would pass. Um, if you're just looking for a pass, that's probably all you need. Um, but the thing is, right, well, why do people get these certifications? Because they want to, um, it's like a professional challenge and they want to do better in their career and they want to actually have an understanding of this so that they can go into those roles, right? So you're still going to need to do a job interview at some point for, for, these, for this particular type of work. And if you just cram for the exam, um, it's highly likely that you won't have the skills required to actually do the job. So you shouldn't be aiming for a pass. That's my opinion. You should, yes, you need a 75, 750 out of 1,000 to pass. Um, however, I think if you're really aiming for anything less than about an 85, you're probably just focusing on the exam and not on the, um, the actual uh, skills that it tests. So <clears throat> what do they say? Don't mistake the forest for the trees or, or something along those lines. That's basically what I'm trying to say. So last part, exam strategy. Um, this is in terms of how you would look at the questions, how you'd arrange things, how you'd flag things and so on. I mean, this is individual to everybody. So you're all going to have your own strategies here, but this is how I do it. And it's worked out quite well. Um, what I will normally do is I'll start off, I'll go left to right, do questions one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 up to 75 or up to 65 or however many questions are in the exam. Um, just in order, because it just makes things simple. You're not jumping around, etc. However, if I come across a question that I'm spending too long on, um, and what I tried to do for the Solutions Architect Professional, so you have 180 or 190, I think it's 190 minutes, uh, and there's 75 questions. So if you do the numbers there, it's slightly over two minutes a question. I tried to aim for two minutes a question so that I had about half an hour at the end to go over things, which you will absolutely 100% use. Um, this was the only exam where I ran out of time, um, although not by a lot. Like I, I, I was pretty much at the point where I was ready to submit, but I did get that the uh, you've run out of time screen. So I go through in order and if I'm spending more than probably a minute and a half or even just a, a minute on a question and I know I'm not going to get it and I know I'm not going to make a good choice about it, I'll just flag it, I won't answer it. If I do have a, a choice where I think, okay, this is maybe I'm 60, 70% sure it's correct, but I still want to return to it, then I'll, I'll still I'll, I'll answer and then I'll flag. Then I move on to the next question and I keep going through that until I get to the end of the exam, try and keep up a steady pace, try and, try and watch the clock, make sure you're sticking to about two minutes a question. I ended up doing slightly under two minutes, somewhere between you know, a minute and 45 a question. So I had about 40 minutes at the end to go over things, which was really, really helpful. Um, I ended up, so that, that once I got to the end, uh, what I did is I, I left all the questions I hadn't flagged uh, that I'd answered because I was reasonably confident about them. I'll say maybe 80 to 90% confident about each of these questions, probably 90% confident about my answers to them. So then I went over the flagged questions first. I started at the start again, flag question, flag question, flag question. And I would choose what I thought was the best answer. If I still couldn't think of the best answer, I would just do my best. And then I'd most likely still just unflag that question. And I would say, I'm done with this one. I'm not going to look at it again unless I'm doing a full pass over the whole thing. And then I keep going through. So what I did from that, I think by the end of the exam, to give you an idea of numbers, so there's 75 questions, I had probably flagged 25 questions maybe so about a third of them and then I came back after that next pass I unflagged all of them because I had looked at all of them and I probably changed my answers to five of them maybe yeah somewhere between five and eight questions so so essentially if you think of this what happened there was I answered two-thirds of the questions I was confident about and then I, I flagged and I, I answered and flagged another one-third so that was all the questions in total and out of that one third, I changed my answers to a third of those. So what that means is, I'd say probably I was sitting over the first pass of the exam where I hadn't checked over those flag questions the first time. I was probably sitting on about an 80, maybe maybe somewhere between 80 and 83, 84 uh, And then after that next pass, that got me probably up to a 90. And then I did a, a slight look over so I had a couple more that I that I ended up changing and the way I did that was I went over basically every question Trying to aim for the ones I hadn't flagged although at that point I had unflagged the ones I had flagged So I didn't know which ones I hadn't flagged originally really I just remembered sort of number ranges and I went over say 20 from, from question 20 to question 50 I remembered I hadn't flagged many and I just kind of skipped through looked at the question Okay, does it seem reasonable next one? I've tried to spend maybe 10 20 seconds on each one That was all the time I had left and I think I changed maybe two at that point. And then I got to basically the end. I probably got to question 68 of 75 and then my time ran up. Um, and so that was my strategy for tackling the exam. I don't think it was perfect, but I don't think it can be uh, materially improved in any great way. Uh, different exams have different strategies. 
if we're going beyond AWS and just talking about exam strategy in general, if you've got an exam where there's multiple choice questions and there's questions that you have to answer as you know, a short answer or an extended response, I would always do those first and leave the multiple choice till last. Uh, the reason for that is you can you can guess a multiple choice, you can't guess a short answer. So, so there's plenty of exam strategies out there, but for this exam where most of the questions are the same type, then I would suggest uh, just following something simple like what I did. It worked out fine for me. I've done that on all the other exams. Um, I think the key takeaway there is pick an amount of time you want to spend on each question and um, do your best to stick to, to that amount of time. If you go under that amount of time, that's great. You have extra time to revise at the end. And if you're ever unsure about a question, flag it. Just use the flagging feature. Uh, there's also the commenting feature. I didn't use that. I felt like it would have been a bit of a waste of time. You can comment on a question and keep notes on it. There were a few questions where it would have been nice to have those notes. For example, um, you know, you do a lot of mental computation here. You look at the answers and you go, okay, this answer versus this answer. There's only one difference and it's this word and that rules out this question, this, this answer because it uh, is actually incorrect for whatever reason. It would be nice to note that, um, but I didn't really want to do that. I felt like it was going to be a bit of a time suck. Um, if you do the exam at a testing center, um, you get a white, it depends on the testing center obviously, but you get sort of like a whiteboard marker and a, and a laminated sheet of paper that you can use for notes. Um, and I have used those in the past. I did this exam at home uh, just because uh, I'm in lockdown at the moment, so you can't really go to the testing center. Uh, doing it at home has been fine aside from, uh, I'm not gonna name the testing provider, but the, <laughs> the application they use for the testing is not very good. It was crashing on my main computer, which was a Mac, and then I had to use an older computer that was a PC and it's been working all right. Look, you know who you are, um, <laughs> and I would suggest that you need to look into getting shorter response times for your um, candidates when they're having technical difficulties. I have spent probably a cumulative four hours on the phone with you guys. So yes, work, doing it from home can be frustrating. I'm just gonna put that out there. They also say that they're gonna get to you within 15 minutes um, of your exam start time, and I have probably averaged out about half an hour. And you just sit there and, and you're not really meant to be on your phone or anything because you're about to start this exam, you're on camera, and you just gotta sit there. It can be frustrating. I have had less frustrating experience at the testing centers, but you have to get to the testing centers, and, and for me that's you know probably 40 minutes um, into the city, so it takes a bit of, of, of time anyway, so that probably evens out overall. Okay. Um, Thanks for listening. I know this was a long video, but I kind of just wanted to sort of brain dump everything that I have been thinking about for the past few weeks. Something else to note, I have um, been working full time through this. So if anyone is here saying, oh, I don't have time to study for this, I'm working full time. Obviously it depends on your job. Some people are working, you know, 70 hour weeks, whereas I'd be more around the 40 mark, but it is completely possible to do this while having a job, especially if that job relates to this, because then you just get to practice during your work hours on, on the projects your company's working on. To everybody listening to this, um, good luck. Please follow the resources. I'll link them all in the description. And please let me know if you use this advice and you end up passing the exam, uh, let me know how you went. Uh, let me know if you have any other suggestions as to resources. And yeah, thanks for listening. Catch you guys later.